Welcome everyone and uh, so this is going to be my take on the FOMC meeting and I'll try to keep it brief and then I'll have a short period afterwards to answer any questions. So let me just kind of recap what actually happened. So let me just switch to some slides here and I'll just speak over these if that's okay. Here we go. So this was market expectations before the meeting. So this shows you the meeting probabilities using the F F Fed FedWatch tool, which is created by the CME. And what you can see here is for each of the meetings, so this is the date of the meeting on the left-hand side, so September, November, December this year, February, March, May next year. And then it shows you the probability of being at a particular rate, federal funds rate range, at that meeting. So this is how markets saw things a few days ago. So there was an 82% probability of a 75 basis point increase. And another 75 basis point increase was the most likely outcome in November. And then it would slow down to 25 basis points. Then it would kind of take a breather at the next meeting in February of 2023. Then another little hike of 25 basis points, the normal hike as it used to be. Then another flat month, then another flat meeting in May. And then finally in June of 2023 would be the first rate cut. Now usually that's a positive signal for equity markets when the Fed cuts rates. So now let's look at how it looks right now. So based on what happened at the meeting. So sure enough, the increase was 0.75% as markets expected. That was the most likely outcome. And so you can see the probability has gone to almost 100%. But now you can see that it's got another 75 basis points as before. But then we move to a 0.5% increase in December. So you can see previously that was 0.25%. So the expectation of markets is now a little bit more hawkish. They're expecting a bigger, more front-loaded policy increase in this year. And the first cut is now a little bit later. It's going to be in September of 2023, whereas previously it was in June. So it's going to be uh, two meetings later. So generally a kind of more hawkish interpretation of Fed policy following following the meeting. Now, what's also interesting is to look at the summary of economic projections. I should stress this is not a forecast from the Fed. It's not an official forecast. The FOMC members just kind of jot down what their expectation is for various macroeconomic indicators like GDP and inflation and the policy rate over this year, next year, the year after that, up to 2025, and then for the longer run. So if you look at those uh, expectations right now, let me make my face a little bit smaller. There we go. You can see that there are some pretty big changes and a pretty remarkable one was to do with the Fed funds rate up to the end of the year for 2022. So here's the column for 2022. The median is a central expectation, the most likely prediction if you like, of the FOMC members. And that's increased hugely by a whole percentage point for December of this year. So what they're now expect for, for the end of this year. So what members are now expecting is 4.4% at the end of this year, rather than 3.4. What that means is their understanding of what's restrictive, what's actually going to get inflation to come down, has increased by a whole percentage point. So what they seem to have realised is that the effect so far has not met their expectation and they're going to have to be more aggressive than previously thought. We kind of saw a hint of that at the Jackson Hole meeting where Powell kind of scrapped his speech and made it much more punchy and short and clear and made it absolutely clear he was fully committed to getting inflation under control. It's a one mandate Fed. So they're really keen on getting inflation under control even if that means economic pain. So this is pretty consistent with that. The other interesting thing is all the expectations of the soft landing. So previously in December, the December meeting, the December projection was that for the end of this year, 
uh, GDP would be at 1.7%, which is not much less than the long-term average for the US, which is 1.8%. But now that's fallen to 0.2%. So they're realising that there's going to have to be a lot more economic pain in terms of lower growth in order to achieve their mandate. So that, that's the way I read it anyway. And only once we get to 2024 do we get back close to the longer run rate of GDP growth. So more pain is required, I think. That's the understanding. And the other form of pain, of course, is unemployment. Because if you do want to get the labour market into a kind of more supply-demand balance situation, then you probably want to get higher unemployment as a in order to get that balance back, at least that's what it's looking like they've admitted. So they've increased the unemployment rate not too much for 2022, from 3.7 to 3.8. The big change is in 2023. I know that doesn't sound like much from 3.9 to 4.4, but that's another million people out of work because the US population is, um, the working population is numbered in the hundreds of millions. So that's why I think um, that's what I think that was my 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 those was, those are what I found most surprising in terms of their projections. So federal fund rate higher at the end of this year by a lot, unemployment higher, GDP lower, so a harder landing, and then with with the PCE inflation number, the headline number, they've actually uh, increased that slightly from 5.2 to 5.4, which is kind of admitting that, you know, it wasn't as low as they'd hoped. And um, even in 2023, they've increased the number, the, the central number has increased slightly as well. So only when we get to 2025 are we getting back to the Fed's longer run target of 2.0%. And if we look at core inflation, Again, you know, they've revised up what their expectations are for 2022 and 2023. So they can see that they're having to be more aggressive and there's going to be pain required to get there. Now, in terms of the median expectation is that we're going to have 150 basis points. That's 1.5% higher rates at the end of this year. How could we get there? Well, we could either have... 75 basis points at the next meeting, then 50 basis points and 25. Or we could have two hikes of 75 and a zero. But I think what's more likely is, is the first one. Now, Pal pointed out that some committee members were 25 basis points lower for their end of year expectations. So for them, it, it would just be a 75 and a 50. And then they'd kind of pause at that point. And as as usual, he kind of reiterated that at some point they would have to pause and kind of take stock or at least to slow their rate increases and take stock of the situation to see whether inflation's slowing down substantially and the effect on the economy. So assess, assessing their dual mandate. If we look at the labour market in the US, it's still very tight. So we still have two jobs available, just under two for every unemployed person. So that's a very tight labour market. And that also suggests that wage inflation is also going to stay high. And it's well above their uh, the level which would be consistent with their 2% mandate. So they're going to have to try and get wage growth down. So that will be another form of pain which US citizens will have to undergo to get to this nirvana of stable prices. There was also interesting talk about reset of the US housing market. If you look at US housing, it's just been going absolutely crazy. And let me just quote some of the stuff that was discussed because that was kind of interesting. Um, I'll just switch back to me here. and I'll just read from the notes I made during the meeting. So I think it was it was talk about a reset of the housing market, which is obviously a bit of a of a, a triggering phrase if people talk about the Great Reset. But he talked about reset a reset in the housing market previously. And 
he, what Powell actually said is that we've had a red hot housing market with houses selling to the first buyer at 10% above the asking price. And that's even before seeing the house. So clearly that's not a sane market. That's a hugely overheated market. And what he's saying is that deceleration of that market should bring prices in line with fundamentals. So things like rental value and also wage growth, of course, which is the long term thing which keeps prices in check for houses. So there's going to have to be some correction. I think he actually used that word for the US housing market to get back to a reasonable place where houses are more affordable. So that was pretty shocking, um, particularly if you've just bought a house uh, like we have. So in fact, this whole backdrop you can see is our is our new house. So I think we've ticked the top of the market here in the UK as well. So I think I think the point, uh, another point which he made was that they've still got a way to go. They certainly haven't achieved their goals. I think they were disappointed that there wasn't more sign of a rebalancing of the of the labour market. There are very few signs that that's happened. For example, he was talking about payroll growth, non-farm payrolls, which has reduced slightly the growth in number of jobs available in the US, but not hugely, certainly not by the amount they'd hope in order to get wage inflation down. There was a lot of talk of economic pain with the journalists kind of saying, well, what kind of pain do you want to give us? You know, I mean, it's how bad is it going to be? And he was saying, look, We've, we've kind of come around to the, to the fact that there will have to be pain to achieve their core objective, which is to get inflation down to 2%. And that'll come in the form of higher funding rates. So mortgages will be more expensive, credit cards more expensive to fund. People will effectively have lower wage growth. And of course, there's going to be less job security if unemployment increases. So you know, one percent, one percentage point increase in unemployment is a big deal over the course of a year. Um, there were some interesting things about the um, the yeah the kind of composition of no 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 I think that's that's fine. Yeah, I think in terms of the description of the economy, it was clear that they'd acknowledged that growth was going to be weaker. And it was interesting how Powell talked about the effect of policy on the economy. So he said, first of all, it affects financial conditions. Sometimes even before they raise interest rates, that somehow signaled to the market via expectations, maybe because of some hints he gave at a previous meeting, but that's almost immediate, if not before the meeting happens. So the financial conditions change really quickly. But of course, the actual effect on inflation operates with a pretty big lag. And that makes assessment of the effect on the economy, in particular growth, but also inflation, very difficult. Because you have to kind of wait for the effects to be fully felt. So if you've raised, much, raised rates too much, then that dampening effect will not be felt for some time. And that makes policy adjustments difficult, of course. So he did talk about that very long lag, but he said the effect on financial conditions was almost immediate. Um, but it's pretty clear that they're going, they now want to get growth in the US running at below trend in order to achieve their goal. I think they've just resigned themselves to that fact. So I think that pretty much covers what I wanted to cover. And... I'm going to hand it over to questions now. So we will we will favour people who support us. So if you're one of our supporters on YouTube, we'll know because it's got a little crown next to my right next to your name. And also you can do a um, super chat, which you have to pay for. You choose how much you pay, but obviously it helps us, so we'd appreciate it to pay for our house <laughs> and our living expenses because this is how. You know, we make our bread and butter. So please do do a super chat or uh, please do support us on YouTube because it helps us a lot and will favour the people who um, will push those people to the front of the queue for answering questions if there are any. So we will just set aside a little bit of time for that.
So who have we got? Dmitry Belyakov, hello. Martin H, nice to see you. That's one of our supporters. Hello, Martin. And let's see if we've got some questions which we can answer. Ah, Lennart von Nebelschutz, nice to see you. Uh, lovely to see you again. It's, it's wonderful to have feel like we have a community that kind of dials into these things uh, regularly. Somebody here commenting on raw materials and lumber and commodity prices. I mean, one of the things that Powell mentioned was that commodity prices have come down. And of course, I speak to many US clients because, you know, I have power hours, which are one to one sessions. And speaking to you people in the US, they definitely sense the very large fall in gasoline prices. That's something which people are really acutely aware of. And that actually affects consumer confidence hugely. So if we do see gasoline prices falling further, that's, you know, that's going to be good for US confidence. And the other point that Powell made was that um, there are signs that supply chains are easing as well. So if you look at freight costs, those have also been coming down. You look at congestion in the port of Los Angeles, that's kind of essentially cleared. So a lot of these supply chain issues have also reduced, which in turn should reduce inflation. So commodities, supply chain issues should help. But a lot of the shock is due to things like, you know, which under are not under Fed control, like Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And that was another point he stressed. So let's have a look. OK, well, I will answer a couple of questions here. So there's a question about the UK, which I won't answer because this is about the Fed. Um, uh, and Leonard von Nebelschutz says, good evening. Thanks for the continued efforts in helping the community and making sense of markets. Um, he says hi to Laura and Teddy, who are obviously listening to this downstairs. OK. Uh, and Richard Watt says, I asked a super chat question last time, but it didn't get answered. I actually did try to answer you, Richard, after the meeting. But... Um, yeah, I think I answered it on YouTube chat, possibly. Um, have a look there. But if you get in touch with us via email, I'm happy to answer the question. But you say you've forgotten the question yourself, so. Um, oh, yeah, so somebody here is saying those are June projections, not December projections. Thank you, Rabbi Ramadan. You're right. So the dot plots that I was talking about were actually from June, not from December. That's right. Uh, let's have a look for another one. Ah, oh, yes. Laura says, I did answer your question on, on the uh, chats. Why the difference between UK and US rates? That's from Tim Wood 101. I think I think there's a big difference between the US in terms of economic strength coming out of the crisis after the pandemic and the UK. So generally, growth in the UK is weaker. The expectations for growth in the UK, if you look at the Bank of England projections, they're projecting a seven quarter, that's almost two years of no growth, negative growth, contraction of the economy. So, you know, the Bank of England's very bearish on the outlook for the UK. So if you're raising interest rates, the problem is that it dampens economic growth. And if you're already in a weak position, which the UK was more than the US, I'd say, then that would make the Bank of England a little bit more reluctant to raise interest rates. But the problem with the UK is that that's hugely weakened sterling versus the dollar. So I think over the course of this year, sterling's weakened by about 18%, which is huge for a developed market currency. So versus the dollar, that is. And if that's the case, then when you import gasoline or petrol, as we call it in the UK, or oil, it's not denominated in dollars and it becomes more expensive, as do any imports which are dollar denominated. 
So I think that's the problem. You get passed through inflation if your currency weakens. So if the UK doesn't raise interest rates, that would weaken its currency further. So it can't afford not to follow the Fed, even if that pushes its own economy deeper into recession. So I think this is one way in which the US is exporting instability globally via its monetary policy. And one of the questions in the meeting afterwards was, do you speak to other central bankers? Because if there's a globally synchronised increase in interest rates, so a global tightening of policy, that's more likely to cause a global recession. So do you ever try to synchronise this with other central bank heads? And Powell said, yeah, in fact, we've just come back from Basel in Switzerland, where we met several other people who are central bank heads. And we're very much aware of the pain that they're feeling at the moment. So clearly they've got a mandate to make things work for the US, but there are second order effects which affect the US through weakening exports if there's weak growth elsewhere. So, you know, they are aware of it, but there's not much they can do in order to mitigate the effects on other countries, particularly emerging markets, which are badly affected when the Fed uh, tightens policy. But I thought that was an interesting insight, you know, that they they do chat t- to each other over a cup of coffee or perhaps a glass of beer to discuss what's going on in other other economies. Of course, they talk to each other and they are aware of what's going on, but I don't think there's much they can do. Um, interesting question from Gary, who is one of our supporters. Thank you, Gary. And he says, "Is do you see any effect on sluice data yet? Yeah, in fact, the sluice data has got a little bit weaker. So let me just pull up the sluice data. So I've got some R code here, which I can run in real time so that you can see this. Uh, Let me just share this so you can see my screen. Otherwise, I'll just be tapping away and it won't make any sense. So this is the sluice data. So if you're not aware, sluice stands for the Senior Loan Officers Survey. And uh, let me just get this looking good. Here we go. So what this is telling me, this is on the right hand panel here, right? So it's a net percentage of domestic banks tightening their credit standards. In other words, if you're a US company and you want to get a loan from a bank, when this gets tighter, it means that it's more difficult to get a loan. Right. And that's generally what happens in a slowdown, because imagine you're the bank manager in the Midwest. Somebody comes to you for a loan. Well, if you're entering a recession, you don't want the loan to go bad and it's getting more risky in a weaker environment. So you tighten up the constraints on who you give money to, the bank's money to. And that's exactly what we're seeing right now. So there was a huge tightening due to the pandemic. Then we have got an easing probably due to what the Fed was doing. But now what we're seeing is a tightening which has begun again. And this is to small firms. Remember, that's where a lot of the growth is. If we look at large to middle market firms, also we're seeing a tightening. So there's no question we are seeing a tightening of credit standards. And generally that's bad for the equity market. If there's a very strong tightening of financial conditions, then you know that's generally negative for equity. So there definitely is an effect, yeah, to answer your question. Switch back to me. And let's see if we've got any other questions. Yes, we've got a question from Martin H, who's also one of our supporters, who says, what are the chances of a larger than expected fall in inflation? Oh, good question. Could people be too gloomy about it all? Yeah, I mean, wouldn't that be amazing if inflation did surprise on the downside? Because nobody's expecting that. Everybody's talking about how sticky inflation is. Isn't transitory inflation a joke? You know, I mean, it's nobody takes that seriously anymore. So if there was a surprisingly low inflation number, and certainly if you look at commodity prices, they are going to go into reverse. The I think the reason why that probably won't happen is because shelter which makes up about a third of the weighting in the US consumption basket, that's been continuing to increase. And with mortgage rates increasing, I think, and house prices still increasing, or at least not falling substantially, I think it's unlikely that shelter is going to immediately fall. 
He said, in fact, Powell actually said, I think that's going to remain high shelter, that component of CPI inflation for some time. Now, I assume he's backed that up with data. Presumably the economists at uh, the Fed have said that to him and to the FOMC. So I think the shelter components and other components like services are still pushing inflation up. But you're right, it would be shocking if if inflation started to uh, fall faster than expected and also very positive for equity markets. That would almost certainly cause a melt up in equity. But so far, it's all looking pretty grim in terms of um, in terms of you know the markets. So let's have a look at what the market reaction has been. Oh, dear. I hadn't seen this yet. So here's my co poor man's Bloomberg, Coifin. And you can see that both the S&P and the Nasdaq really didn't like what Powell said. So we've got that falling by, well, 1.5 percent for the 1.6 percent for the S&P, 1.6 percent for Nasdaq. Clearly, this was a bearish message. And you can see that in the Fed Funds futures as well, which we covered at the beginning. And if you look at which styles have done worst, well, it's kind of. I'd say, you know, large caps, small caps, it's pretty much across the board. Uh, so, you know, there is no clear style which has been hit. Um, but yeah, equ equity markets, clearly not too happy about it all. But, you know, long term treasuries or actually mid to mid sort of intermediate treasuries, government, GOVT actually rallied a tiny bit. So, you know, there is that. But anyway, yeah, not um, not a good reaction. So let's draw a line under it there, I think, unless we've got any other questions. I mustn't fail to answer a question like I did last time. I'm sorry about that. Um, no, I think that's it. So thank you all for joining us. I hope it was helpful. I hope um, you learned something and you've got a little bit of insight into how the Fed operates. Don't forget that we have a community where you can learn more about investing, and that's just go to pensioncraft.com to join our community, where you can ask questions on Slack anytime you like. We've got a big library of members-only content. You get to vote on what we ask, um, what questions I answer every, every week. And um, it's a very friendly community where you can learn about investing with like-minded people, with a kind of long-term mindset rather than a quick buck, which is the way many people approach investing. So thank you all for joining us, and I'll uh, look forward to the next time we do one of these YouTube Lives. And if you are one of our members, I'll see you much sooner. So take care, everyone, and um, 